If it were not for volcanic activity, the United States would be short of a state. It would be short of Hawaii because the Hawaiian island chain consists simply of volcanoes. One, in fact, of the most active volcanic areas in the world, Kilauea, in one of its eruptions not very long ago, erupted 600 million cubic yards of lava, which is sufficient to put a four-lane highway around the world three times. A lot of material. But Hawaii is, in fact, not typical of the volcanic areas of the world because it sits within a plate. And you remember that most activity, geological activity, takes place at the margins of plates. You remember that, I hope, from last week. And so it is with volcanic activity. Volcanoes that have been in the news, such as Sertse around Iceland and the Guadeloupe volcanoes, are at the margins of plates. In Iceland, the plates are spreading apart, and in Guadeloupe and that area of the Antilles, they're coming together. During this unit, we shall be concerned mainly with the location of volcanoes in relation to plates and also to the products of volcanic activity. The first half hour of the hour is taken up with the Planet of Man program, The Fire Within, and then a further half hour of volcanoes. Volcanoes are certainly one of the most interesting of natural phenomena, and uh, they occur, of course, not at random, but only at certain places. And they seem to occur, those places seem to be where plates are moving, where the tectonic plates are moving relative to one another. They occur along island arcs, like Japan and uh, the uh, West Indies and uh, the Aleutian Islands, quite large numbers of them. And uh, they also occur where plates are moving apart uh, along the mid-ocean ridges, in places like the Azores and uh, Iceland where we know that the ground is actually moving apart, tearing apart. The volcanoes have their uh, advantages as well as their disadvantages. Uh, for example, in Java, where there are many active volcanoes, and from time to time eruptions kill large numbers of people there, um, they also, the ash falls, cover the land with fresh ash, which may be devastating at the time it occurs, but which uh, later forms very good soil. Java is able to support a very dense population, one of the densest in the world. Through me you enter eternal grief. Through me you enter among the lost. Justice moved my high maker. The divine power made me the supreme wisdom and the primal love. Before me, nothing was created, if not eternal, and eternal I endure. Abandon every hope, you who enter. Vulcan, the Roman god of fire and earthquakes, lived here. From this place, the island volcano, Vulcanism took its name. So terrifying was Vulcan's power that man has built great temples to pacify him, for he was a short-tempered, jealous god. Volcanoes are national symbols in Japan. Most revered is Mount Fuji. Every summer, pilgrims make their way to the summit. And once a year, there's a fire festival to soothe the restless god. Today, science has unmasked the myth of Vulcan and exposed the cause of his anger. Yet can molten rock be stayed by appeasement of the spirits? Volcanic activity is as old as the planet itself. Distributed in sinuous belts, active volcanoes occur both on land and sea floor. Between these zones of activity, the Earth's surface is generally inactive. These areas are rigid slabs or plates of cool, brittle rock approximately 60 miles thick. They move 
move about very slowly on a hot, less rigid layer beneath. This movement of plates adjacent to one another produces molten rock in two different ways. Where two plates separate, pressure is reduced. This allows some melting to occur at depth. Molten rock full of gas erupts at the surface through fissures. Where two plates converge, one slides beneath the other. The friction generates intense heat. Molten rock erupts at the surface through vents or pipes. Molten rock, produced where plates separate, is usually so fluid that it flows almost like water. When it cools, it solidifies to a rock type called basalt. Rock produced where plates come together is often thick and viscous when molten. It cools to a rock type of granitic composition. When molten rock reaches the surface, it loses much of its gas and pours out as lava. The viscosity or fluid nature of this lava determines to a great extent the kind of volcanic eruption. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Roman statesman Pliny the Younger described the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. The event was dramatized in the 1912 Italian epic, Cabiria. Broad flames shone out in several places from Mount Vesuvius. Their brightness seemed to make the surrounding darkness even more impenetrable. Cinders, which grew thicker and hotter the nearer we approached, and pumice stones fell into the ships. Then, suddenly we were in shallow water, and the shore was blocked by the debris from the mountain. produced where two plates converge can be extremely explosive. Because of the viscosity of the lava, gas cannot bubble out and escape without violence. Explosions disperse the solidifying lava. Blocks and cinders fall close to the volcanic vent, building up the characteristic steep-sided cone. and dreadful cloud with rapid zigzag flashes revealed behind it various shaped masses of flame, like sheet lightning, but much larger. The buildings were now shaking with violent shocks and seemed to be swaying to and fro as if they were torn from their foundations. Heated gases, charged with red-hot dust or ash, light the night sky. Dust in the atmosphere can reduce the heat radiation from the sun and temporarily chill the climate. Electrical charges built up by the propulsion of loose material into the atmosphere are discharged as lightning and thunder. see a dense pall of smoke behind us getting bigger and bigger, following us like a river. We could hear women screaming, children crying, and men shouting. Most people had lost faith in the gods and were convinced that this must be their last night on Earth, the end of the world. Pompeii and its citizens were buried under a blanket of cinders and ash spewed out by Vesuvius. The city lay buried and forgotten for 19 centuries. 
Upon excavation, plaster casts were made of bodies taken from cavities in the consolidated ash. These cone-shaped volcanoes, like Vesuvius, are produced by converging plates and are characterized by lavas of granitic composition. Often violently eruptive in nature, they are found along mountain belts and island arcs, particularly in the notorious ring of fire that surrounds the Pacific Ocean. The second kind of volcano occurs for the most part along huge mid-oceanic ridges and is characterized by basaltic lava. Only in a few places do these ridges and their volcanoes break the surface. On January 23, 1973, the Westman Islands off Iceland experienced a major eruption of this kind. I live on a small island of Heima, which felt some little earth tremors but none of us expected the eruption to open a fissure a mile long, just outside our little fishing town of Vestmania. Sirens wailed to wake up the town, and we were told to go down to the harbor. Fishing boats were standing by to take our families to the mainland. In Iceland, the plates are splitting and spreading. Lava erupts at the surface through fissures or rifts. Burning gases escape without much violence. On the second day, all activity died away except for one crater in the middle of the fissure. changed direction and ash and cinders rained down on the town. Hot cinders slice through the window panes as easily as a knife through butter. Explosive activity, like that on Heimei, occurs along the fissures. Usually the lava floods the countryside. The lava can flow at speeds of 30 miles per hour. A few weeks later, a great wall of lava moved in the direction of the town and the harbor. In six days, one-fifth of the town had disappeared. The buildings that didn't burn were crushed. that pumpy seawater on the lava seemed to slow down its advance. We worked day and night to stop it before it blocked our harbor entrance. In one eruption, Lava may spread over several hundred square miles, building up enormous plateaus of basaltic rock.
where the lava spills into the sea, it forms some of the newest land on Earth. This unique underwater film reveals for the first time how lava behaves in a submarine eruption. All the sound is natural and authentic. The outer lava rapidly chills in contact with the water. The fluid lava breaks out of this skin to form pillow-shaped blobs. As the pillow cools, the lava shrinks, the gas contracts, and it collapses inwardly. Pillow lavas can be found today on every continent. Deep within a lava flow, the rock cools very slowly. As it cools, it shrinks and sometimes fractures into these remarkably regular columns. Monuments to past eruptions post the Earth's surface. Through the immensity of geological time, erosion has removed most of the clues to their past existence. But lava flows resist weathering and are conspicuous in older rocks. These pillow lavas in the Northwest Territories are several billion years old. Here, pillow lavas have been draped with sediments deposited from a long extinct sea. This rock, made of angular fragments of volcanic material, is called breccia. It was formed by a mud flow of ash similar to the one which buried parts of Pompeii. The ash and other fragments discharged by volcanoes are poorly consolidated and quickly eroded. The badlands of the petrified forest, each layer representing the dust and ash deposited in one eruption, have almost disappeared. Since much of the surface evidence for past volcanoes has gone, scientists must examine what lies below if they hope to identify their graves. As a plate splits apart, it undergoes stretching and fracturing. Molten rock pushes into the fractures. When cool, these vertical slabs are called dikes the Celtic word for wall. Less commonly, molten rock spreads out in sheets between parallel beds of sedimentary rock. These are called sills. Given time, the dikes and sills are exposed by erosion of the softer surrounding rock.
this dike in the Northwest Territories is several billion years old. Before the Atlantic Ocean opened, there was stretching and fracturing of the continent that was there earlier. The evidence, basalt dikes along the east coast of Baffin Island. These are matched by dikes of a similar composition and similar age along the west coast of Scotland. There must have been a fissure-type eruption here 60 million years ago. Where one plate slides beneath another, molten rock, large quantities of fluids and gases eat their way upwards, creating large, irregular chambers. Large blocks may fall in and become partly assimilated. Molten rock that doesn't reach the surface solidifies at depth. Again, erosion selectively wears away the softer rock. The coast ranges of British Columbia and the Yukon have been carved out of huge granite chambers. In the ragged range, you can actually see the contact between the gray granite and the rusty colored rock that once surrounded it. Some much smaller granite bodies have proven to be rich sources of minerals. At Bingham Canyon in Utah, tens of thousands of tons of copper are extracted every year. This pit represents just a small part of the granite body. It's the largest open pit mine in the world, two and a half miles wide, more than a half mile deep, there's over 120 miles of railway track within it. By careful study of these and similar rocks, scientists know whether volcanoes were produced by... Two plates separating? Two plates converging. But there's a third type of volcano, not associated with any major movements at plate boundaries. This type of volcano occurs in the middle of plates. The Hawaiian volcanoes are an example. Like Iceland, eruptions occur along rifts and fissures. The lava is extremely fluid and is similar in composition to that produced at spreading plate boundaries. The flickering lights are burning trees. is still a mystery. One recent theory is rapidly gaining acceptance. The Hawaiian volcanoes are produced above a hot spot or plume rising underneath the plate. The plume transports large amounts of heat from deep within the earth to the surface, causing melting and volcanism. Since the plate is in motion over the hot spot, the first volcanoes are presently carried away. New volcanoes form over the plume. The result is a chain of progressively older volcanic islands, all extinct except for the one directly over the hot spot. This is a typical eruption, with fountains of liquid lava bursting 800 feet into the air.
Successive flows have built dome-shaped volcanoes that form some of the largest mountains in the world. Mauna Loa rose from a depth of 15,000 feet below sea level to nearly the same height above sea level, a total of nearly 30,000 feet. from the bowels of the earth. The thought provokes awe and fear, the occurrence, panic, and devastation. But the air we breathe and the water we drink are the result of vapors and gases discharged from long forgotten volcanoes. The fertilizing properties of ash and lava produces good soil. Millions of people are enticed to live in the shadows of volcanic disaster. Volcanic activity is one of the main agents that concentrates minerals for man's use. Here, hot water has dissolved sulfur deep in the earth. As the steam cools, the sulfur is precipitated on the walls of the vent. Hot springs and geysers continue long after the actual eruption. Some of this energy has already been harnessed for mankind. The geothermal plant at Werakai supplies 18% of the electricity needed by New Zealand's North Island. Perhaps when our resources of fossil fuels are gone, the fire within will help solve man's chronic quest for energy.
In the program on igneous rocks, you'll remember that we distinguished three main types of volcanic or extrusive igneous rocks. The first of these was basalt. The second was andesite, the andesite being less mafic in composition than the basalt, that is having fewer uh, mafic minerals rich in iron and magnesium. And the third rock, the poorest in uh, iron and magnesium minerals, was rhyolite, the most silicious of the, the three. In the program you've just seen, these different kinds of volcanic igneous rocks, those which are extruded under the surface, are associated with particular situations related to the uh, boundaries of the lithospheric plates which form the surface of the Earth. In the first case, basalt is associated with the splitting apart of lithospheric plates in the centers of oceans. Basalt is the rock which occurs at um, <coughs> the mid-ocean ridges. In the second case, basalt is associated with uh, the splitting apart of continental lithosphere. In the third case, once again, basalt is associated with volcanoes which form within the boundaries of lithospheric plates within the oceans. Hawaii is an example of uh, this kind of, uh, of volcanic activity. In the fourth case, um, volcanic activity is associated with a subduction zone where oceanic lithosphere dives down beneath uh, another slab of oceanic lithosphere and an island arc, such as the islands of Japan, is produced on the uppermost slab above the descending plate. And finally, in the fifth case, volcanic activity is also associated with the situation of oceanic lithosphere diving down beneath the margin of a continent, a continent formed, of course, of continental lithosphere. And this kind of situation is the kind that's found in the Andes on the western coast of South America. In this program, we shall examine those situations and the reason for the difference in the lava that's erupted at those various sites in a little more detail than in the program you've just seen. But first, let's look at the characteristics uh, in review of the main lava types. Basalt is usually very fluid and forms um, flat, sheet-like areas such as the Columbia River Plateau. This is the eruption of basalt uh, through continental lithosphere to appear on the land surface. But not all basalt is quite as fluid as that. Some is rather blocky. We call this a'a lava. This is a Hawaiian word. And uh, the most fluid kind of lava also has a Hawaiian name, pahoihoi. This is a very fluid kind of basalt lava. And sometimes this kind of lava flows around trees when it flows over a land surface and leaves behind what we call tree casts. Now, the difference between the aha and pahoihoi lava, the aha being blocky and the pahoihoi being fluid, is probably caused by differences, first of all, in temperature. The fluid lava is probably hotter than the blocky lava. And also, there's probably more gas still held in the fluid lava, which tends to make it um, <clears throat> run faster, as it were, than in the blocky lava, from which most of the gas has escaped. The main site, site where basalt lava is erupted is in the centers of the oceans. There, something in the order of 50 billion uh, cubic kilometers is, 50 billion tons, I'm sorry, is extruded annually. The site where uh, the less mafic lavas are erupted is the um, subduction zone site. There, the andesites and the rhyolites are erupted. And the andesites and rhyolites are thicker than the basalts. The rhyolites, for example, produce rather stubby cones, not at all like the, uh, the sheets that the basalt produced in the Columbia River Plateau. The reason for the difference between the fluidity of the basalt and the rhyolite 
lies not always in the temperature nor in the content of the gas, as it did between the Yaha and the Pahoihoi lavas, which were just varieties of basalt lava, but probably lies in the content of silica. And you can imagine the difference being related to the number of oxygen silicon tetrahedra. You'll remember those, I hope, from the previous programs. The number of oxygen silicon tetrahedra that are in the liquid. The more oxygen silicon tetrahedra, then the thicker the liquid. Think of them um, sort of being sticky tetrahedra, if you like, um, <clears throat> in the rhyolites, because there's more silicon and more oxygen, there are more tetrahedra, and they're thicker in the basalts. There is less um, quartz, less feldspar. The iron-rich minerals um, <clears throat> have less silica in them, and there are fewer oxygen silicon tetrahedra. So that's probably the reason for the difference between the rhyolite and the, um, the basalt lavas, the differences in their viscosity. Now, since basalt lava is the lava which is erupted at mid-ocean ridges, it's the lava which generally, but not always, but generally forms the pillow lavas, the eruption of which uh, you just saw on the film in some quite unique and exciting footage. You'll probably remember from the film the very fine exposures of pillow lava in the Northwest Territories. Originally poured out on the floor of a Precambrian ocean, these pillows have been cut through, and you don't see the three-dimensional pillow-like form. What you see is a cross-section, smoothed by glaciation. These originally rugged outcrops are now quite rounded. 2,000 miles away, Dr. Rowley Riddler of the Geological Survey of Canada describes similar pillow lavas on the um, shores of Hudson's Bay. This particular pillow lava flow is an andesite. This means that it's of more intermediate composition and has about 55% silica. Nevertheless, it shows the same characteristics as other pillow lava flows. In particular, it has the bulbous mass of lava encased within a darker material, which we call the selvage. The selvage is an original case which enclosed the lava. It's formed of a glassy material, which is extremely fine-grained and contains a great deal of volatile material. And later on, when the rock lithifies, it forms a distinctly different color and texture from the interior of the pillow, nicely defining the structure for us and allowing us to interpret the upper curved surface as being the top and the lower surface as being the bottom. This is a piece of pillow lava like that described by Dr. Riddler. And here is the edge or the outside of a cross section of an individual pillow. That's the dark selvage that he mentioned. Here is the, uh, the rounded third dimension of the pillow, which you weren't able to see in the cross sections of the rock outcrop. Another structure which is quite dramatic in igneous rocks when one can find it, it's not all that common, was a structure that you saw in the film in the Giant's Causeway. These are the hexagonal six-sided columns which form a kind of pavement at the Giant's Causeway. This is produced by contraction of the cooling basalt uh, as it, the temperature drops after its eruption. The six-sided form is produced because contraction takes place towards centers. And the six-sided form is a very economical form for material to contract into when it cools. You also see the same kind of um, <coughs> form, same kind of six-sided structure produced when mud dries, for example, and, and contracts. It's a quite common form. The gas which is dissolved in uh, magma and in lava when it erupts at the surface is important in a number of ways. You've already heard in the film that the gas is important in contributing or was important in contributing to the early atmosphere of the earth and also important in contributing to the water of the oceans. In fact water um, in the form of steam obviously forms about 70 sometimes even as much as 95 percent of the gases erupted from a volcano. Carbon dioxide is another very important gas, and then also there's sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, chlorine, and a number of, other, number of others. It's the very explosive uh, 
um, release of gas that causes the, uh, the violence of the eruptions when um, igneous rock reaches the surface and produces the rocks that we call pyroclastic or fire-broken rocks. Such fragmental, broken-up volcanic debris lies like a sheet around um, such volcanoes as in Hawaii, for example. And amongst this uh, debris, larger fragments are called volcanic bombs. Accumulations of uh, such debris often form cones such as um, this cone off the south coast of Iceland, close to the volcano of Sertse, which erupted in the 60s and was quite um, often mentioned in the, in the news. This is volcanic ash. It's a crumbly, uh, very easily broken up rock, not yet uh, lithified or converted into hard rock. And this is pumice, which is also associated with um, explosive volcanoes. The holes are the holes in which gas was trapped. Um, <clears throat> the consolidated deposits of ash and pumice are quite often found in the geological record and indicate quite clearly a period of volcanic activity in the geological history of the area. In the Northwest Territories, there are very extensive exposures of Precambrian fragmental volcanic rocks, now consolidated as beds of volcanic breccia, tilted on edge as the result of later mountain building. Finer volcanic ash or tuff forms the thin layers, and erosion by waves has led the fragments to stand out on the surface of the outcrop. The fragments are very similar to rocks forming lava flows and dikes in the same region. This cross-section of the subsurface beneath an area where volcanoes have erupted, such as here and here, shows quite clearly why the dikes and sills in an area are usually related uh, in composition of the rocks to the pyroclastics or the volcanics. For example, here are the volcanic uh, lavas and the pyroclastics, and the dikes and the sills in the same area form part of the plumbing system of the volcano. And it's for this reason that, the, um, that these rocks are related when one finds them in the field. The violence of the eruptions um, of a volcano leads us to be able to classify volcanoes into those which are very explosive and those which are less explosive. The kinds which produce explosive pyroclastic debris on some occasions and lava on others form what are called composite volcanic cones. Mount Fuji in Japan is a typical example of a composite cone with the profile steepening towards the crater at the top. Another island arc volcano, Mount Mayan in the Philippines, is another example, although this is made of a little more ash than Mount Fuji. The violent eruptions of volcanoes are characterized by the release of a great deal of gas. And in the most violent eruptions, the phenomenon of a glowing gas cloud occasionally uh, occurs. It was such a glowing gas cloud which destroyed uh, Pompeii, probably, and also Montpellier in Martinique in the early part of this century. Such a cloud is composed of very hot gas um, at perhaps 800 degrees centigrade, loaded with glass fragments produced by the blowing to pieces of rock froth, such as pumice. But the most violent eruptions are those which produce calderas. In this case, the uh, volcano releases an enormous amount of gas uh, all at one time, uh, with the energy of perhaps 16,000 megatons of TNT, compared with the uh, fifth of a megaton of a Hiroshima bomb. In this case, the top of the volcano is blown right off, and what remains subsides into the, uh, the cavity which is, which is left. Uh, Krakatoa, which erupted in 1883, is a typical example of the 
uh, formation of a caldera. Uh, Krakatoa erupted again in 1929, not with anything like the same violence, uh, but some archive footage of that occurrence is quite interesting to, to look at. The film is unfortunately badly scratched, but it still gives a very good idea of the violence of such an eruption, not by any means, of course, as violent as the classic eruption of 1883, but nevertheless a, a good taste of the activity for which Krakatoa is, is famous. The eruption took place, as you can see, beneath the surface of, a, uh, of the sea, in fact, which invaded the caldera which was created in 1883. The observations that were made at that time were not done with the sophisticated instruments which are available today. The dark material is uh, fragmented pumice and ash. Of course, there's a great deal of steam derived from the heating of the seawater. The so-called Crater Lake in Oregon is uh, an example of a rather small caldera. The Wizard Island, as it's called, in the center is later, uh, later cone, and the cliffs around the, the lake form the margin of the caldera. Another caldera occurs in Hawaii, where it forms the volcano Kilauea. It's important because of being the site of a volcano observatory. The area is very active volcanically, and the combination of laboratory and on-the-spot field observations at Kilauea make it one of the most important sites for the observation of volcanoes in the, the world. The lava on Hawaii is very fluid and streams down the flanks of the volcanoes in a dramatic fashion. Often erupting from rifts, these fountains are twice the height of the Niagara Falls. A lot of gas escapes from the very hot, bubbling lava, and it's that gas which propels the lava into dramatic fountains, often reaching over a thousand feet in height. The lava gathers in lakes at the summit of the Hawaiian volcanoes. And after an eruption, the liquid lava, cooled on the surface, drains back into the magma chamber, or reservoir, that lies just beneath the surface of the, the volcano. The lava originally came from a depth of about 60 or 70 kilometers, and gathered in a chamber about three kilometers beneath the surface. The movement of the lava from the deep chamber into the local reservoir is recorded by seismometers. Portable instruments are placed all around the flanks of the volcanoes, and the signals are received back at the central observatory via cables. These are often destroyed during eruptions and have to be relayed. The portable seismometers record earthquakes. Earthquakes caused usually by the movement of the liquid rock making its way towards the the surface. Some of the records received are quite typical earthquakes with a sudden shock. Here you see the needle passing over the trace of an earlier earthquake. And suddenly another earthquake occurs. A quite sudden shock. About 150 of these are received on an average day at the observatory. But most of the record that's received at the observatory is called harmonic tremor and differs somewhat from normal earthquakes. The harmonic tremor that's received by the instruments can be likened to the record that you would get if you shook a jelly. The volcano just shakes and shudders like a jelly, sometimes for days because of the movement of the liquid to the surface. Here, quite violent harmonic tremor is recorded, and here, much less violent, quite placid, in fact, uh, tremor is recorded. By comparing the harmonic tremor records from different instruments on the flanks of the volcano, it's possible to locate the site of the major movement upward of liquid towards the surface, and therefore, of course, predict where an eruption is likely to take place. 
prediction of likely eruptions can also be made by measuring changes in the volcano's uh, profile. The volcano swells as material moves towards the surface, and poles, calibrated poles, placed at the corners of triangles, move upward and relative to one another as the volcano swells. A sensitive leveling instrument placed in the center of the triangle and sheltered from the movement of wind can measure the movement of the poles up and down. Here, deflation followed an eruption, and inflation is occurring probably to predict or as a precursor of another eruption. Laboratory observations can also be made of, of field observations can also be made of the distance between fixed points on the volcano. This instrument projects light about five kilometers from a marked point on the volcano to a reflector on the other side of the crater. And by measuring the time that it takes for the light to be reflected back to the transmitting instrument, very accurate measurements can be made of the distance between the instruments. Usually there's a change in distance of several centimeters immediately prior to an eruption. So measurement of the change in distance can also allow prediction of an ensuing quake. Once an eruption begins, then laboratory readings are supplemented by actual observations from observers at the site of the eruption. They're in constant radio contact with home base, so to speak, and report on the height of fountaining lava and on the uh, suspected temperature of the lava and so forth. And that supplements the readings which are made on seismometers back at the central observatory. The eruptions on Hawaii are both spectacular for the tourist and important for the scientist. The regularity of the eruptions allows scientific observations to be made every day. One doesn't have to wait 10 years for the next eruption. And that's important for drawing conclusions which can be applied to other volcanoes which erupt less frequently. Mechanisms for predicting the eruptions on Hawaii can be applied to other volcanoes that seem to be, to be dormant, the techniques of measuring tilt and expansion and so forth, and the movement of magma beneath the, the volcano can all be applied to other sites. And these predictions have already allowed villagers to be evacuated from sites in Hawaii on the flanks of Kilauea, where eruptions have subsequently engulfed the village. Such precautions will probably soon be possible at many other potentially dangerous volcanic sites. The volcanic activity in Hawaii, which is where the volcano Kilauea is situated, is typical of one of the five differently located sites of volcanic activity that we briefly looked at at the beginning of the program. So let's return to those five different sites and look at them in more detail and pay particular attention to the origin of the magma. In the first case, where lithospheric plates are splitting in the center of an ocean, this is a mid-ocean ridge, the lava is basalt lava, and it's derived from the asthenosphere, which lies beneath the lithospheric plates. In the second case, which is also a case of the splitting of a lithospheric plate, the lava, again, is basalt, and again is derived from the asthenosphere. This is the kind of volcanic activity that's associated with the splitting apart of continental lithosphere and is the first stage in the growth of an ocean between two uh, fragments of continent. In the third case, the lava is a, again basalt, and this is the Hawaiian example. In this case, too, the basalt lava is derived from the asthenosphere, and you'll remember that the asthenosphere is we think about 10% percent 
liquid. And it's the collection of that liquid and its movement towards the surface which provides the lava in these first three cases. In the case of Hawaii, the difference to the first two is that the volcano sits within a lithospheric plate. Hawaii is well nearly towards the center of the Pacific lithospheric plate. In the fourth example, the origin of the lava is very different. In this case, the um, <clears throat> volcanic activity is at a subduction zone where a piece of lithospheric plate is diving down beneath another. And the volcanoes grow on the edge of the overriding plate, if you like. And in this case, the lava is derived by the melting of the downgoing slab, which is, of course, quite cold on the surface, where it's cooled by the oceans, but becomes much hotter as it gets deeper within the Earth. Just like um, igneous rocks don't crystallize all at once, so the plate doesn't melt all at once. And in fact, uh, the lava is derived from the melting of about 20% of the plate. And the first mineral to begin to melt, or to begin to change is better, uh, is pyroxene. And pyroxene changes into garnet, the mineral garnet, because of the increase in the pressure and the temperature. And when that, in, when that change takes place, the elements aluminum and sodium and silicon and oxygen are released. Atoms of those elements are released, if you like, in a molten form. And also, from micas, the element potassium is released. And it's the collection of these elements into liquid form which rises and forms the volcano on the margin of the overriding plate. In the fifth example, the mechanism of the derivation of the lava is quite similar. But in this case, the volcanoes are built on a piece of continental lithosphere beneath which the uh, oceanic lithosphere is descending. And as the molten material from the descending plate rises, it becomes contaminated or it mixes with molten material derived by the heating of